The lecture is entitled Medical Futility, Reexamining the Goals of Medicine. And this lecture is going to be given to us by a distinguished uh, physician, researcher, uh, Larry Schneiderman, who is with the California two or three years ago. Two or three years ago, he uh, is continuing to do uh, a lot of research down at his home base in San Diego. Most recently, he has particularly been focusing on futility. And I believe that I've heard a similar lecture given uh, in another locale, and I believe you'll find it very challenging. Uh, he will spend 30, uh, 35 minutes in uh, giving you his challenging thoughts in a very uh, uh, compelling new area in the new medical economics here in America. And then uh, I see some of my students here. I've encouraged them to ask you hard questions, uh, Larry. And we will have uh, 15 or 20 minutes for uh, questions and answers. Uh, Larry, we're very happy that you're here. Thank you. Can you hear me all right? Yeah, I'll, I'll hold this. How's that? <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, for, uh, we're starting a little late, and I know it's very important in any kind of session like this to have plenty of time for questions and answers, so I will try to leave ample time for that. First of all, I want to thank you for inviting me. I know what I'm going to say today actually is very challenging in particular to some of you who have strong religious beliefs about the notions that I will be uh, discussing. And I think uh, this will give us a very good opportunity to exchange because I do treasure the whole notion of pluralism in this country. And I think that what we have to learn to do is somehow see if we can understand each other's positions and, and also if we can uh, somehow make things work. Uh, the, the notion of medical futility comes up uh, at a time when there are so many things happening. I don't have to tell you what's happening in Washington or the concerns about the rising costs of medical care. Uh, so it's very important, I think, that we start to address ourselves to what exactly are the goals of medicine. We've really had to re-examine this whole notion. What is it that physicians are obligated to provide and what is it that they ought not to be expected to do? This is what is at the crux of the futility debate. And if I could have the first slide. First of all, there's some people who say, look, this whole notion of futility is, is ridiculous. It's too elusive to define. And they suggest a number of definitions, which I'd like to go into. And in my view, we can dis really dispose of most of those uh, very simply. First of all, some people say the whole point of medicine is to achieve the patient's goals. Whatever the patient wants, medicine is obligated to provide. And the only definition of futility that holds is if we're unable to achieve the patient's goals. I would like to point out that this means, therefore, that we would be expected to do mutilating surgery under certain circumstances, that uh, a patient who came to us who said he wanted to be a world-class bodybuilder and would like us to provide steroids would expect us, therefore, to, to uh, submit to that request. This clearly is not one of the obligations of medicine. To do that would be not only unethical, it's illegal. There's a case which some of you may already be familiar with, which il illustrates this point very pointedly for a group such as I'm, a, I'm speaking to here, Helga Wangley was a woman in her 80s who, as a result of a failed cardiac uh, resuscitation attempt, was left in persistent vegetative state. To explain this to some of you who may not be familiar with this, the cortex of the brain, a very thin surface actually, about the thickness of a, of a kind of winter uh, sheet, uh, a flannel sheet, over the brain was destroyed during the period of anoxia. And she was therefore unable to experience, to have any will, to, to understand what was going on, to communicate. Everything that we associate with personhood was irrevocably destroyed. We, are now, we now have about five to 10,000 people like this who are being maintained in what we call the persistent vegetative state. Uh, for, and they can live as this biological entity for decades. Why? Because the brainstem is intact, so they can swallow, their respiration is OK, their per, uh, peristalsis is OK, the, the heart rate is still working. But they are in a state where they are just absolutely 
I, I once used the word in exile, as though they're absolutely separated, isolated from any kind of human contact or human experience, okay? The family was presented with the fact that this woman would never regain consciousness, insisted that the doctors keep treating her in expectation of a miracle. And the question that's most challenging, and I, and I put it to you, are doctors obligated to provide miracles? I would argue that the answer is no, that in the old days when people wanted miracles, they went to church to pray. What they're doing now is they're going to the hospitals and demanding it of doctors. Clearly, the medical profession has never been obligated to provide miracles. The second uh, definition that, that we have to ask is, is it the inability to prolong life? And again, we can refer to the Helga Wangley, where her life is being prolonged, if you mean biological existence. And it's very interesting, if you go back to the Hippocratic tradition, prolonging life was not part of the medical profession's goals until the late Middle uh, Ages. In fact, the Hippocratic tradition, as I will point out a little bit later, really tried to avoid any taint of miracles, of wonder, of, of, uh, of charlatanism. In other words, they did not see their work as being supernatural because they were surrounded by people who made such claims. So in fact, the Hippocratic physician had two objectives, to restore health in balance with nature, and if that was impossible, to alleviate suffering. As I said, it wasn't until religion became more incorporated into the practice of medicine, some of which you may be familiar with, but it began in the late Middle Ages, many centuries later after the tradition of medicine, the Western tradition of medicine got established, that the notion of prolonging life, of seeking miracles, was first imparted. It later was reinforced in the 17th century by the scientific methods that were beginning to develop and the attitudes that science was not used to assist nature, but to oppose nature, to somehow overthrow the natural forces. So this notion of prolonging life has very dubious roots in the tradition of medicine. I should also point out that theologians, scientists, anyone, even up to the last few decades, could not imagine the life that we are preserving today. They had no notion of persistent vegetative state, which I've just described, which didn't exist as a diagnostic entity until about three decades ago. We simply didn't produce life in those forms. So all the stages of life that we now are producing by our high technology, all those stages between perfect health and death, were never imagined by those people who said the, the goal of medicine is to preserve life. And in fact, if you look at some of the Talmudic literature, one of the reasons why life should be preserved at all costs was to allow the person always to confess. Now, this was a vision that life would allow that last second confession. And clearly, a patient in persistent vegetative state had no such capacity, OK? So that's why I don't think that that is an appropriate goal of medicine. The third one, and this has also been advocated as a quote, value-free definition that look, you know, everything that we talk about in medicine is value-laden, that the only job of medicine is to produce an effect on the body, and if you can keep the heart going, the lungs going, then you should keep doing it. It's not futile until it's absolutely impossible to achieve a physiological effect on the body. I would argue that's not a value-free definition. In fact, that's the value choice, which is about as far away from the patient-centered tradition of medical practice as it's possible to be. We are, in medicine, supposed to heal human beings, persons, and therefore, I argue that the goal of medicine is to achieve a therapeutic benefit, and a benefit is an effect that can be appreciated for the patient. And the word patient comes from suffering. In other words, it is not just some random individual who has a, a whim, like he wants to be a world-class bodybuilder. This is a patient who comes to the physician because he's suffering, she's suffering, and wants a benefit, one that that person, that patient, can appreciate. Okay, now, some those who argue that we should uh, do away with futility as a term or that the term is too elusive have to contend with the fact that it's, it's a word that's commonly used in medical discourse. We're using it all the time, and in fact, there are many authoritative societies and representations of the professional and ethical community 
who've already gone in, in writing as to say uh, physicians are not obligated to provide futile treatment. And that includes the President's Commission, the Hastings Center guidelines, Baby Doe guidelines. Some of you know that that's probably the most aggressive uh, guidelines in terms of treatment of handicapped newborns. Uh, that also makes allowances for not treating when the, when the treatment is virtually futile or virtually futile and inhumane. The AMA Council, American Thoracic Society Task Force, Critical Care, those are all the societies who have in, in just in print said physicians are not obligated to provide futile treatment, and the only question is what do we mean by futile treatment? Let's go down to a definition of futile, and the source of it comes from the word futilis, which was an ancient religious vessel that was wide on the top, narrow on the bottom, was used in religious ceremonies. It tipped over easily because it was so impractical it became known to be futile to use this kind of uh, uh, receptacle. And that's where the word futilis uh, led to futility, which in the Oxford English Dictionary is defined as leaky, vain, failing of the desired end through intrinsic defect. And the question that we are pursuing is what is the desired end in medicine? Now, the notion of futility has both a quantitative and qualitative component. In other words, something just you try it over and over again, it doesn't work, begins to imply some kind of probabilistic or quantitative notion of futility. The outcome may be so bad that even if it works, you say, this is really not what we're supposed to be doing in medicine. And so both of these function. The quantitative actually can be traced directly back to the Hippocratic tradition. And I pointed out that the Hippocratic physician abjured the notion of achieving miracles. Whenever the f illness is too strong for the available remedies, the physician surely must not expect that it can be overcome by medicine. This is from the Hippocratic corpus. And the next one, to attempt futile treatment is to display an ignorance that is allied to madness. Now, from the Plato's Republic, we get a, the qualitative notion, the Platonic Escalapian tradition that comes up. And this comes from the Republic. For those whose lives are always in a state of intersectness, Escalapius, and some of you will learn that he was a classic divine physician, did not attempt to prescribe a regimen to make their life a prolonged misery. And then the next one, which is really important, a life of preoccupation with illness and neglect of work isn't worth living. I'd like to come back to that word preoccupation. In other words, if you're preoccupied with the illness so that you can do nothing else, have you achieved a successful outcome of, medic of medicine? Okay, first let's explore a little bit the quantitative notion. One of the things that we have to deal with in medicine is the, what we all recognize as the uncertainty problem. You medical students have already probably have already heard never say never, or we can never say never. The fact is that our whole lives are based on empirical observations. You try something once, if A happens and B follows, you do it again, A happens and B follows, you begin after a while to bring up, build up a certain confidence that maybe A is causally related to B, or at least a certain amount of confidence that every time you see A, B will occur. How many times does this have to happen before you feel pretty confident? Just the opposite. If you start with A, and B doesn't follow, and you keep trying A, keep trying A, and B doesn't follow, how many times do you have to do that before you decide, hmm, doesn't look like B will ever follow A. In other words, this is the kind of empirical experience that we use in medicine for whether or not to take a chest x-ray, what dose of digoxin to use, whether or not to do surgery. It's that kind of empirical evidence that we use not only in medicine and in fact in our entire lives. So the question is not, can you be sure a treatment won't work or can you be sure a treatment is futile? The question should be, how many times do you have to fail before you decide it doesn't look like this works? I'm proposing, can we agree that if a treatment has not worked in the last 100 cases, almost certainly it is futile? We, as common sense people, if you tried something 100 times and it didn't work, would you not say, hmm, looks like it's futile? Now, you may have different numbers, and I'm willing to hear any number, in other words, because this is where we're exploring the notion of quantitative empirical observation. And I just point out the 95% upper confidence interval if you've repeated this over again. 
But the point again is, if we decide something has been tried so often that doesn't work, we now no longer have any confidence that it'll work, we regard that particular treatment as futile, then the ordinary duty of the physician does not require offering this treatment. Now, what's interesting is when, you know, I'm influenced by the P.01, like all of you are and will be. And what was interesting is that I, you know, in, co in conjunction with my colleagues Albert Johnson and Nancy Jecker and chewing over this ocean, I began to think, has anyone else in the medical uh, profession of come up with anything similar to this. And what I discovered was in the last few years, there actually have been empirical studies where people have tried something and concluded because that something failed that it was futile. And for example, the very first one I came by is a, a Pangburin and others who tried dexamethasone in primary supertentorial hemorrhage. They tried it on 46 patients. It never worked. Their conclusion very tentative, the first effort in this way, hey, maybe we're doing something wrong, it should be reconsidered. Kellerman in 1988 was bolder. Uh, tried uh, CPR out of the hospital before bringing patients into the emergency room. Tried it on 281 cases. Only four survived to hospital discharge. In other words, if it failed in the outside, they whipped them into the emergency room, kept pumping on them, put them through the hospital, discharged them. Only four out of their 281 uh, survived. Their conclusion, forget it. If it doesn't work in the out-of-hospital setting, cease efforts. It is futile. Notice the upper limit of confidence intervals, about 3%. Again, we're beginning to see that after a certain number, they begin to say it's futile. Now, Lantos and others uh, in 1988, CPR in very low birth weight babies in the first 72 hours, tried it on 38, not one of them survived to hospital discharge. Their conclusion, it is futile. Once again, they're there the, under those. They, they, this was a controversial paper because this is actually the smallest number that I found. But in a sense, you see that after a certain number, they said, it doesn't seem to work. Murphy and others in 1989, he also and their group also tried out of hospital CPR. If it didn't work and the patient was elderly, it's futile. They tried it on 244. Only two of those patients survived to hospital discharge. Notice all the time what the outcome measure is, survival to hospital discharge. Faber Langendon in 1991 did a, what we call a meta-analysis. He, he looked at studies from a variety of reports. Every time they tried CPR in patients with metastatic cancer, 127 times they tried, zero survived to hospital discharge. Her conclusion, it's futile. Again, upper limit of 95% confidence interval is 3%. And Gray et al., again, out of hospital CPR, if it didn't work, and they found it didn't re, uh, lead to hospital discharge at all after 185 tries, again, the same upper 95% confidence interval, their conclusion is not worthwhile. What I'm driving at here is all these individuals were independent, were not aware of each other's work, and yet there seemed to be a consensus developing around a certain number, okay? A certain confidence interval that, gee, if it doesn't work this many times, uh, and their outcome measure being uh, out of hospital, that's what they thought was the important outcome, then it's futile. So there does seem to be emerging a consensus in the professional community. Now, I'd also like to argue that there's a logical uh, reason for uh, supporting a notion of quantitative futility. It's a very simple one. Uh, we all know about the placebo effect. We also know that if something hasn't worked in the last 500 times, say, and then all of a sudden something happens which appears to make it seem as though it worked, we have no idea why that event occurred. We don't know if it was a treatment. If it worked then, why didn't it work 499 other times? In other words, a clinical situation is so puzzling and, and so full of complexity that after a certain point, we can no longer ascribe causality to an, an event that occurs, but also we know it's confounded by the placebo effect. If you give just sterile water injections to patients in pain, it's been shown over and over again, at least as many as 30% of the patient will have complete relief of pain. And I'm talking about real pain, pain that was demonstrated during the war on, on soldiers that were injured and had major injuries. So in other words, 
If we are morally obligated to offer any treatment that may have worked or that may conceivably work, then in the absence of a proven treatment, the physician would be obligated to offer a placebo. But we're not. We don't practice medicine in the way that if we have nothing that works, we're obligated to offer placebo. Think of what would happen to medicine if patients were never sure when we gave them something whether we really believed in the efficacy or we really were just giving it to them because we felt obligated to try to get the placebo effect. For one thing, the paradox of the placebo effect would be destroyed. But the other thing is it would completely break down the trust between the doctor and the patient. So clearly, just because something may have worked or may conceivably work doesn't mean that we are obligated to provide it. Now, in terms of the qualitative aspect of medical futility, again, I want to point out, the goal of medicine is not merely to provide an effect. We can do anything. We can raise and lower blood pressure. We can exchange hearts. We know we can keep kidneys going. It, but that's not what we're in the business of doing. We are trying to achieve a benefit which can be appreciated by the patient. Therefore, I will argue, the treatment is futile if a patient remains in persistent vegetative state, simply because that patient is incapable of appreciating anything. So there is no treatment, nothing, that can benefit the patient. Therefore, every treatment, every effort at maintaining life is futile. I would even go further. I would say that a patient whose treatment keeps that patient inextricably uh, involved in the intensive care unit so that person can't get out of the intensive care unit. There are patients like that now, today. I do ethics consulting. I've seen people in for months. I've even been involved with a child, and this one was in persistent vegetative state that was in the intensive care unit for over a year. There was no way that you could get that patient out of the intensive care unit so dependent were they on the administrations of the, of the, the treat, treatment providers. And yet there was nothing this person could do with that life. That's what I'm talking about, the platonic notion of preoccupied with the illness. In other words, no goal was achieved other than keeping the patient alive in the intensive care unit so that that person could achieve nothing with that life that was provided. I would argue if that's the best we can do, that we have to admit that's a medical failure, that that's not a successful outcome, therefore that treatment is futile. Okay, now, having argued and sounding fairly you know, rigid about this, let, let me point out that we in the practice of medicine are also involved with human beings. Physicians are human beings, patients are human beings, families are human, uh, and, and, and society obviously has, has considerable input into this. So let me point out some of the exceptions and cautions that we do have to keep in mind. Sometimes people have argued that if you don't offer a futile treatment, therefore you're not obliged to talk to the patient about it. For example, I see patients uh, with headache, and I certainly don't say, well, now let's sit down and I'm going to tell you about brain surgery because there's always a distant remote possibility of, of a brain tumor. This is simply ridiculous. Nor do we in, on the wards, every time we order an alkaline phosphatase or do a CBC, go to the family or the patient and say, I'm about to do such and such. If it's part of the routine and, and it's, it's not something that the patient is intensely concerned about, we don't feel obligated always to inform the patient every time we consider a treatment. On the other hand, there are circumstances where we would not offer the treatment, but we sure do owe the patient the, the information. And I would argue that the ICU, again, is the place where the patient looks around and sees CPR being done to the right and to the left, and that patient might have terminal metastatic cancer, which by our definition, we've already decided is futile to, to do attempt CPR. Even though you do not offer CPR to that patient, that patient I think is entitled to the information. I think the kind, compassionate physician would sit down and make sure you probably are wondering, are we gonna do CPR? This is not appropriate treatment, and then go into it with a family if necessary, too. But in other words, the information I do think you owe the patient, even though you don't owe the treatment. Now, obviously, there are, you know, someone will say, well, what about the, the, the mother who wants to say goodbye, you know, and there's a, uh, or the grandmother who wants to say goodbye, and there's some son flying in from out of town. Yes, we always should make compassionate exceptions for these short-term exceptions, which have, very minor 
consequences in terms of, look, our duty is not to offer CPR, but we recognize under these circumstances we'll make an exception. And so the dying patient wishing CPR to allow one last visit by a loved one is an easy exception to make. What isn't an easy exception to make is the family with, uh, in, with a patient in, in persistent vegetative state who insists that that patient be kept alive. That's a violation of the notion of the professional ethic and of the notion of futility that could last for decades. So that clearly is a violation that the medical profession should not get into. But short-term exceptions are quite clearly within the compassionate notion of medical practice. Now, why is it important that we try to, to really concentrate on clarifying this notion? For one thing, well, for one thing, I have found, and, and my colleagues, and uh, uh, my colleague Nancy Checker and I have reported on the enormous number of ways that the word futility is being abused and misused. Uh, doctors say that's futile, and 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 that and. And it, we have no standards for that. And that's a real problem in medicine. It's not that we don't have the word and that I'm trying to get people to think about it. The word is constantly in use and people are not thinking about it. So I think the value of trying to establish some kind of clear cut notion is that it encourages clarity of thinking. In particular, and this is one of the, 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 the confusions that I run into a lot, in distinguishing futility where we admit there's no therapeutic benefit from rationing, which we acknowledge there is a benefit, but ask, is this worth the cost or do we have enough uh, uh, resources to go around? Heart transplant is not futile treatment. Heart transplant clearly benefits patients. On the other hand, we don't have enough hearts. We don't always know when is the, what is the best patient to, uh, to use this particular treatment on. We don't know if we're willing to spend all the money on heart transplants if we are depriving prenatal care, uh, outpatient psychiatric care, basic medical prevention. If, in other words, our society decides, yes, indeed, heart transplants are a benefit, but we cannot afford it and also afford all these other things which we have a higher value towards, then that's the difference. And it's important that we clear up. I mean, this is what Oregon is trying to do. Oregon is trying to establish a value system which says, look, this is our society. We, you know, there's no free lunch. We don't have unlimited resources. How are we going to distribute what we have? You may argue with how they've done it, but you can't argue with the fact that it will have to be done. What clearly doesn't belong in a list like that are treatments that have no benefit whatsoever. It doesn't matter how cheap something is. If it doesn't work, it shouldn't even be part of the obligation of the medical profession. Also, I think it's very important that we start demanding that, that we see studies reporting not only positive outcomes to be adopted, which we all want to hear about, but negative therapeutic outcomes to be avoided. And it's interesting, I only found a handful of papers, you see. What, now, more and more, Investigators, for example, uh, who are working with bone marrow transplants are just beginning to discover patients who have undergone bone marrow transplantation who require ventilation have probably no chance of leaving the hospital. This is a new discovery, but it was there for years. The people are now retrospectively looking at their data, discovering they have hundreds of examples. I mean, this is a relatively new treatment, but already they've had that experience. They never thought to look. So in other words, there are plenty of treatments that we should be demanding. We find out, hey, if this doesn't work, we shouldn't be using it just as much as we want to know if this does work, we want to use it. And then the process that we go to try to get this is, first of all, can we find some kind of consensus, first in the professional community, because the, the, the lay public has to be enlightened, has to be educated. You can't expect them spontaneously to all agree to, uh, to this as a definition. We went through this process, by the way, with a uniform definition of death. We actually went through a period of time where there was controversy of, you know, is whole brain death? Does death depend on the heart stopping, the, the lungs stopping? And we finally sorted that out, first within the professional community, when we were able to educate the public, and now it is accepted by the vast majority of society, that definition. And I submit that we will probably go through a process very similar, although it'll never be legalized. Futility, I can't imagine, being legislatively uh, determined because it is a much more subtle process. But in, a, in the same sense, though, it has to proceed from us to the, the, the lay public. Now, one other point that I want to make is, 
in our arguments about whether or not to employ CPR or should we or shouldn't we pull the plug, we're ignoring this whole other area of medical obligation, which is comfort care. And so I'm saying that the very important thing is, and this is very important for a, a religious uh, orientation in medical practice, that we should expand decision making from narrow consideration of life-saving treatments to an ethic of care. This has a long tradition in medicine. So that it's not simply, we can't do this anymore, forget it, and the doctor walks away. We can't save your life, but here is what we can do to make that life that's left most comfortable and with the greatest amount of dignity and find ways to enhance that by improving doctor-nurse interactions, institutional facilities. Most, I don't know what it's like here, but in the hospitals I work with, most patients die in the intensive care unit. That's not where patients should die. It's clearly the least intimate setting for a good death to occur. So we have to do better about that. Insurance policies and public education, all this has to be modified to allow for this whole ethic of care, which we have neglected, I'm afraid, uh, in pursuit of this notion that life at all costs must be pro preserved. Okay, there are further implications, which you also might not like, uh, but th this, is, this is the way it, it sort of follows logically. If a treatment is shown to be futile, it should no longer be offered except as an experimental trial, requiring human subject approval and patient-informed consent. I believe that CPR should not be offered to patients with metastatic cancer except as an experimental method. And so you have to have a reasonable hypothesis. You have to have human subject approval. You have to inform the patient that this is not treatment. This is an experiment, OK? From now on, I think that we start with the notion that CPR doesn't seem to work in metastatic cancer. I better have a very good reason for trying it. That's, and people argue, well, gee, you know, we'll never, we'll never pr progress in medicine if we give up. The fact is, we should give up on things that don't work. This will spur us to look for better ways to do CPR or better indications for CPR. In other words, flogging a patient with the same old treatment, which has already been shown not to work, is not the way medicine progresses. It's only by forcing us to change our way of doing things that makes it, it improve. I argue also that patients do not have a right to unproven treatments on grounds that their disease is serious and no treatment of proven benefit is available. And I'm obviously referring to the AIDS activists and the Alzheimer activists, and I stand there are going to be more and more, you know, kind of affinity groups that are agitating for access to treatments which haven't been proved to work under FDA auspices on the argument that, well, they have a serious disease and their only alternative is death. The fact is dying patients deserve as much consideration, much protection as patients who have a chance of living. And just because you have that as your, as your, as your burden does not give you a right to demand that the medical profession give you things which do not work or at least have not been shown to work. Okay, just a couple of objections. Now, you know, clearly we'll hear objections here, but I want to anticipate a few. Alec Capron, who's a lawyer down the road uh, here, uh, says their definition, that proposal which I just uh, mentioned, rests on a view that merely preserving permanent unconsciousness or failing to end total dependence on intensive medical care are ends inherently outside legitimate medical practice. Yet as the Wangley case, which I described to you, makes apparent, some people value other outcomes. The argument, again, is is the profession obligated to provide anything the patient wants? And since uh, Alec Capron is a lawyer, I would argue with Alec. I s would say, look, if you've done your best to defend a client from a murder conviction, you've lost. The man is now in jail, life imprisonment in jail. He demands that you phone the governor every day for clemency. Would you feel that every day you owe that man a, a, a phone call? At some point, you'd say, wait a minute. I've done my best, just as we did the medical profession did their best with Helen Wangley. It failed. Now we no longer feel obligated to keep this process going, which will not work. And I would submit there's a lot more chance that the governor would grant clemency to a lawyer who persisted every day than that Hel Helga Wangley would wake up. And so in other words, this kind of notion that doctors owe patients whatever they want just doesn't fit, in my opinion, with the legitimate goals of medicine.
Uh, Trug, and uh, I'll just read a couple of his comments because I, 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 I really want to tie this up. Uh, they, they argue that only physiologic fragility, the last one down the bottom, understood in narrow terms, comes close to providing a value-free understanding of futility. I think that's an absurd idea that that's value-free, and I, I argue that it's a value choice to say the physiologic futility is the end outcome. And they say, even in theory, statistical inferences about what might happen to groups of patients do not permit accurate predictions of what will happen to the next such patient. I agree with that, but as I've already pointed out, the empirical basis of medicine is run just that way. Okay, very quickly, the next steps. Acknowledge that the word futility is widely used in medical practice. Agree to use it in more consistent and explicit fashion than it is today, seek a specific meaning through open debate and consensus seeking, such as a meeting like this. Start with a general proposal that futility means treatment that offers no benefit to the patient above a minimum quantitative or qualitative threshold. Then see whether the medical profession can agree to what counts as a minimum probability or minimal quality of life. Introduce this definition into practice by encouraging uh, publications of positive and negative outcomes. These empirical studies will form the basis for defining standards of care for clinical situations. This is the way the medical profession then leads to the law and leads to society. The way it is now, if the medical profession doesn't establish its own standards of care, then the law courts will do it in a very haphazard, ad hoc way. Declare these standards of care openly as institutional policies for the information of public and as guidelines to the courts. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Schneiderman. Uh, and I apologize for rushing you through your scintillating presentation, but uh, I'm looking forward to a good 15 minutes of, uh, of questions and, and answers. Let me begin while the audience is, is thinking. Uh, there was one point, and you probably just didn't have time, but I found this to be one of the more, more interesting, perhaps controversial points. When it comes to patients who would not get treatment because it's futile, one category had to do with persistent vegetative state patients. But the other category that was on the screen, but perhaps you didn't have time to comment on it, is ICU patients. And as I read, it's IC patients in the ICU who will remain in the ICU. Would you just comment on, on that since you didn't have time earlier? Okay, well, first of all, I'd like to point out that our outcome where we're saying, first of all, let's say persistent vegetative state, they can achieve no benefit or experience no benefit, let's call that futile. The next step is patients who can't get out of the intensive care unit can achieve no legitimate medical benefit if all they can do is be kept alive in the intensive care unit, simply because you can't do anything with that life. You can't, you can't interact, you can't achieve any goals in, in terms of relationships. Uh, you can't be part of any community other than the ICU community. So in other words, I would say if that's the best you can do, admit that that's not a medical success. I would also point out that that's a very conservative outcome compared to all the others that were measured were discharged from the hospital. Now this is not a serious disagreement. This is where you folks now have to start saying, as a member of society and the medical profession, I prefer not to make it so liberal as discharge from the hospital. I would prefer to limit it to the ICU, or you might say, listen, limiting the ICU is so f artificial. If you can't get out of the hospital, I mean, my goodness, then what are we doing? So, so that might be the outcome. But this is something that has to be worked through by the consensus method. Uh, could you say just, excuse me, um, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll be quiet and go to, uh, to others, but I have some questions that if there's time. Um, let's see, you say is Bob, Bob, Orr, Orr. Bob Orr was, has he already gone? Yeah. Okay, okay, let's, uh, let's start. Um, let me see who has uh, comments or questions. Okay, I've got uh, one, two, three, four. Why don't we take uh, those for limited time? Why don't I just take these four and then you comment? Uh, yes. It would be unethical to, um, to, to, to fill out an informed consent type document or to provide informed consent 
to a nursing home patient with end-stage Alzheimer's regarding CPR. As you may know, the state, the Department of Health Services is currently haggling with CMA over informed consent in the nursing home setting, and effective literally in a couple of months, all doctors in nursing homes are going to have to be actually completing written uh, informed consent on on the use of psychotherapeutics or restraints. Now, CPR is, is given across the board in nursing homes, and currently there's no inform, there's no implied need for informed consent by the state. Do you think it would be unethical to approach a patient and ask to actually have written informed consent with regard to CPR, since in that case it might be perceived as futile? Do you want to do? Well, it's so specific. Okay. I think we should. First of all, this is one of the most challenging areas of the use of the advanced directives. Patients with Alzheimer's disease start out being physically healthy, but mentally begin to lose their capacity to make judgments. Many years can go by. This is where the advanced directive really should be used more often. While they still have the capacity to make decisions, then years later, when they finally require CPR, the question will have already been asked. Now, I do not think anyone can give informed consent if they don't have mental capacity to make those judgments, and it doesn't matter whether it's Alzheimer's or not. So the answer is simply, if they have the mental capacity, then they should be able to make the decision. If they don't, then they can't. And one protection that they should have is the use of the advanced directives. If it's futile, I, again, and the information is the same, if it's futile, I would not bother to try to inform someone who has no capacity to understand any information. I mean, it just, you know, you could try, but it, if it's misleading to think that telling a patient who doesn't have mental capacity to make what we call decision-making capacity, who lacks that, it doesn't, it doesn't help to, to, to it's, it's merely a, a pro forma uh, reaction. Well, they're certainly sure decision maker. In other words, I, I should have said that, but the state asked that informed consent be granted to the surrogate decision maker if the patient lacks capacity. But one way or the other, the state is currently demanding written informed consent for many things in the nursing home this year. Yeah. Again, I, I think. CPR is one of those, as we know, is one of those strange procedures where you have to get permission not to do it. Every other procedure, you have to get permission to do it. CPR is one of those rare ones which you do not, and futility enters in there because we have to treat this like every other treatment, and that if it doesn't work, it should not be given even though the patient or the family didn't want it, whether or not they want well, but Larry, it. But Larry, isn't an undergirding element to this question, the qualitative issue that you raised, and doesn't that show that there is disparity in society on that? Uh, you know, a sort of implicit vitalism seems to underlie some policies that we have, and how are we going to come to some consensus which, which recognizes that if people don't have any type of qualitative functioning in life that the state is not obligated or the medical profession is not obligated to, to ensure mere vitalistic existence? Well, okay, first let me say I don't think CPR, the attitude of society towards CPR represents therefore a notion that vitalism is the, is the underlying value. I think CPR is one of those great misunderstood expressions. We now, and I would suggest your hospital do the same thing, have written a DNAR or, uh, policy, do not attempt resuscitation. That's number one. CPR is always attempted. What is involved, many patients don't understand because usually the question is, and if you look at the most famous uh, uh, durable power of attorney for healthcare, which lists the procedures, do you want your heart started if it stops, is there anyone in this room who would say no? But if then you say, and then here's what we have to do. We intubate you, we stick an endotracheal tube, we pound on your chest, we break a few ribs, you have a good chance that you won't come out neurologically intact. If you start telling patients the truth and really provide the information, the, <laughs> the, the attitudes towards CPR really change remarkably. So it's one of those things where society, by looking at television, has got this notion of CPR as you know, always achieving a, a you know, beautiful-looking blonde model <laughs> at the end or, or, or some handsome uh, actor who carries on and wins the auto race or whatever. I mean, it's just it's so unrealistic. <laughs> As far as the vitalist notion, 
Vitalism, if it means the biological existence without conscious autonomy, I think that's where medicine should really be drawing the line. If you say a diminished quality of life, I'd be very, no, absolutely not. That isn't futile. That's up to the patient and the patient's family to decide. Anything that has to do with a perceived or experienced quality of life that gets it outside of unconsciousness or the intensive care unit, in my view, would be clearly the patient's prerogative or the family's prerogative. Thank you. Yes, Lee. Um, I have sort of a two-part question that I hope will um, sort of focus in on. We can't hear you. Want to stand up? Or you can the audience too. <laughs> Want to make sure you can hear me. Um, I have sort of a two-part question here, and hopefully it'll be sort of practically um, focused for those who are um, practicing clinicians. W when you talk about CPR, that's in some respects a very easy issue to address. There are some empirical data out there that will help us and guide us and it's been published and it is sort of a risk benefit type procedure that has high risk associated with it. What about other uh, treatment modalities that are less aggressive or intensive and in particular what do you propose that we do in the interim while we're waiting for this empirical data in the clinics and in the uh, ICU setting and the second part of my question is you refer to I believe John Lantos's study with extremely low birth weight infants and that study, I believe the criteria was 750 grams or less, and when you talk about standards of care, that's a very difficult thing to do because, as you know, it varies widely from region to region and even institution to institution. In fact, we have a 23 and a half weeker in the NICU right now who weighs just under 500 grams. So to say that that would be futile would be uh, difficult and at best. So I was wondering how you would address those two issues. Okay, to answer the second question first, you, you come tell me when that uh, 500 grammar has left the hospital, okay? Because that, remember, was the test that John Lantos and, and his group employed. I would be very interested in your data. I, the second part is very important, that, that just because it doesn't work in one hospital doesn't mean it doesn't work in other hospitals, and vice versa. Lantos works at the University of Chicago. Uh, uh, for class medical center. This is a first class medical center. I would be very interested if your data is different, if it represents different ways of doing things. Then we start asking questions. Why is it different? In other words, what are you doing differently? Uh, to, is this therefore does it undermine the notion that that uh, that CPR in the very low birth weight baby is futile? In other words, several years old too, and as you know, technology and things have changed. People have argued that, but I, every time I hear that, I ask, give me a later reference, and I talk to, I work at San Diego Children's Hospital, and I ask, are we doing any better? It's a very good medical center. No, you know, and so I would like to see the data. That's what I'm arguing. We need that data. Now, as far as your first point goes, again, I take a very conservative position. Never use the word futile unless you have some good grounding, some good standards for it. So at the present time, I would argue against the notion of using futility if in doubt. This is still an option that the family is entitled to unless it's something where you clearly, on the basis of empirical data, can say, no, it's futile. So what I would hope is that as you offer, and these are a whole variety of treatments and circumstances. Some of you may know about uh, William Knauss's work using the Apache scoring system. There are now studies which show empirical outcomes can actually be fairly closely followed in relationship to organ failure. The more organs that fail in the intensive care unit, the less likely a patient is to ever leave. And if it gets up as high as three organ failure, that's getting right up into the futility area. That's the sort of data other hospitals should be collecting too. Okay, we have only five minutes left. Uh, we have a couple of comments here. Any, who else would like to speak? Uh, do I see anyone else? Uh, not at this time. So uh, this gentleman and then Dr. Miller and then why don't, perhaps we can have these two comments and then you can uh, sum up and, and we'll conclude. Is, is it possible for society to declare or uh, to, to uh, yeah, decide if a procedure is futile? based on cost effectiveness. In other words, you could allocate these resources to go to something else and get more bang for your buck. And, uh, you know, 
could you say that, that uh, ethically that something was futile just based on, you know, using costs as a basis to save lives in other areas? Okay. <coughs> Uh, I hope I made a distinction between futility and rationing. That's a rationing argument. It's very important for us to acknowledge some things work, but we may not want to pay for it, as opposed to, let's find out first if it works. If you keep those two distinct, then you don't, you don't confuse and add to the list of things that we should entertain. And I think Oregon, for example, made a mistake. Bottom of their list is life maintenance of anencephalic newborns, okay? Now, in my view, that's futile, okay? That shouldn't even be on the list. Now, clearly, they regard it as a so low benefit, but it really, truly is, by my definition, our definition, futile. It simply doesn't, it has no benefit to the, to the infant, so it shouldn't be there. Okay, now, there are other things that do belong there where we have to make those kinds of decisions on the basis of uh, cost and allocation. Okay, uh, Ron. There are many things that could be said. The first and most important is that this is a wonderful talk, and it does make people think more clearly. I think some, some ha have objected to the word futility and are beginning to associate it with you, um, objected on the basis that it's a conclusory term. Can you hear in the back? It, it really has the conclusion built into the word. Um, when, when in fact uh, you would allow both a quantitative as well as a qualitative perception of it. And <clears throat> I'm particularly worried in, in, with respect to the slippery slope here. Just suppose I'm an ICU physician, an intensivist. I love my ICU. I love the nurses that work in the ICU. I now have a condition upon which my life is dependent of living in that ICU. Why not? And <clears throat> even if you say that 99% of society would not wish to live the rest of their days in the ICU, what about those institutionalized in what uh, once was called a home for the mentally retarded? Uh, wh where are we going to draw the line on this slippery slope of futility? Whenever I hear the word slippery slope, I say, remember, when we get up on the slope, we learn how to snow plow. Just because there's a slope doesn't mean we have to go shushing right down to the bottom. We learn how to handle slippery slopes. As far as the patient who loves the intensive care unit, yes, I, I've been involved with patients who are perfectly happy to be in the intensive care unit. The question we have to ask, is that what intensive care units are for? They were originally designed to provide acute emergency treatment, the expectation was the patient got better and left or the patient died. Not that this was a home for patients who wanted to live there for months or years. This simply is not a function of the intensive care unit. We have to ask ourselves, if you want to redefine the role of medicine to provide homes for patients in the intensive care unit, then you are violating the long tradition of medicine. If you want to say, look, medicine has to acknowledge that sometimes it fails. Sometimes the failure gets you so far, but not as far as you want to go. But it's still a failure. In other words, we are capable today of keeping bodies alive with technology that we never dreamed of 30 years ago. And so we have to say, at that point, maybe we should just simply say, if we can't get you out of the intensive care unit, we can't keep you here. Even in the person whose brain is functioning perfectly well. I would argue, is there some the alternative? Relate in the ICU. Well, then that patient might be able to be moved out of the ICU. You know, that, and that will, okay, that will force us in medicine to say, maybe we're not doing a good job with those kinds of patients. If the only place we can keep them is in the intensive care unit, that we're lacking something. Just like I, I submit, we're doing a terrible job with patients who come to the ICU, their families are there, they want to say goodbye, we want to help them remove the, the ventilator, give them morphine, give them a good death. We do it in the intensive care unit where they're looking around, lights are flashing, bells are going off, nurses are running back and forth. This is not a good place to die. This is not the way most of us would like to go. This is not the, the, our concept of the good death. 
we should do better in medicine, and we should start thinking of what can we do with patients like that. And I would submit we should do the same with this and kind of patient who can only survive on a regular hospital ward. This debate between Dr. Ron Miller, a nephrologist at UCI, and Dr. Schneiderman will continue upstairs, where you are all invited.